So I'm afraid it's the time of week when you get another load of waffle from me. We, uh, we start off this week's update in the fields, looking at our cover crops and roots, and in particular relation to carbon. We're doing a trial in conjunction with uh, Agri and Alltech and the NFU, looking at our carbon footprint to see where we are. And uh, I've got Ruben and Tom involved in that, doing that for me, which I think is great to get them doing something like that. And uh, carbon credits and trading them to other industries who have a job to reduce their carbon footprint, I think it's going to form a big part of farm incomes uh, in the future. Another thing we look at is sugar beet deliveries. We had 27 loads in the factory uh, this week, so we're looking at that. We also attended the Midlands Machinery Show. I went on uh, Wednesday at Newark Showground, which is only a few miles down the road from me. We also got invited to look around the dealership Farrells. They're a nationwide dealership of John Deere. They've opened the new depot with me at Newark. So again, very impressive setup there. We also get spraying glyphosate on quite a few fields that are coming next year's spring crops. So that's good in re really good conditions. And just touching on last week's um, update, I had a question regarding continuous wheats. Why do we have wheats year on year in the same field rather than in between break crops? And it's simple that the returns from wheat at the moment are, are good. Our heavy land gives us good returns, good yields. We will achieve yields anywhere between nine and a half and 11 tonnes per hectare. So that, that's a, a good return. So that's why we, we do that. So any more questions, please come on to me. I'll endeavour to answer them all. Anyway, uh, on to this week's update. Hope you enjoy it. Click like, click subscribe, and we'll see you at the end. <laughs> We're in our cover crop trial field. We've had in a trial for six, seven years. I've got Steve, we've got Fred, who's our agronomist, and we've got Joe, all from Agri and Tom and Ruben here, and we're looking at carbon, we're looking at the benefits of cover crops on our heavy clay soils. This soil is probably around 45, 50% clay in some areas, and we're just looking at the benefits of that, and we're looking at how it impacts, uh, or will impact on carbon in the future. Get into that soil. Right the way through there. Yeah. And that's what's holding this, this soil in the condition it is. It's that root matter that's doing it, or certainly helping with it. If we can find this and tease it apart, look at all that. When did we drill it? It'll be second week in September. September. There's the seed yeah. that you popped in. And this lot is then all that root. Generally, a farm with the vetches, depends which species, You'll have as much root as you have top. In fact, we've probably got more. And there's the nodulation, there's the nitrogen mixing. Yeah. That's occurring as well. So a lovely root structure um, and nodulation forming. So that in combination with my radish root, which is that sort of shape. And so we've got in that little spitful. That's the sort of root system that we've put in place to help with that soil. But it was only put in early, mid, second week in September. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't on, had, on heavier soils, yep. but we know they're a bit slow. Yeah. Mm. If we went up on the heath, these things are up there. 15 inches so tall, aren't they? And we always think of crops as sucking stuff out of the soil, but actually what you want with this, and with all crops really, but especially with this, is a bit of soil out. And the key bit is people stop here and go, oh yeah, it looks really smeary and it looks rubbish. But the thing is, get in it and open it out in half and ideally do it on a bit of plastic or something like that so you can take a picture afterwards as well. Look at all that fantastic rooting. <coughs> so even though you'll have that, you'll have your sort of like flow chart assessment if you come to do this and it's got those five different categories and you can just flick through them really easily and just score at one to five. Yeah. Um, so the first thing you do is just have a look at the aggregates. So you break them apart and just so, see how they are quite difficult to break up, but you'd expect that from this soil type. And the thing that you're starting to look for then is when you're breaking them apart, in a much lighter soil, you, you'd probably start to see a lot more pores. So all of the little holes that you see, so you know you've got the worm holes, which are quite big, yeah. but then you see all the, all the little ones. We're now looking at compaction here and the rows or where the loosening leg has been. So, where we put that in. So directly behind the tines, we can go down to probably... Yeah. Depend on the soil moisture. So, 
So now we're in the between the tines. We started to hit resistance, probably about six inches, and now we fit it now. Feel that, yeah. And now we're breaking through that, and it's going easier again. And that's, that's on a solid layer now. We're in the red. It's in the red, yeah. Yeah, four and a half, eighteen. But yeah, obviously you should go through. Yeah, you know, find all the worms in the assessment, score them. Adults and juveniles as a basis would be would be really helpful because then you get an idea on your population. But groups would be even better. We're now digging on a tram line to see the effect. I've hit with my spade something that was you've turning this, a bit hard. Yeah, you've got this sort of lateral, this horizontally cracked yeah, section. See how that's quite different, moving away in layers? And it's very, very solid, yeah. isn't it? So <laughs> We're now in another field next door that we always compare the cover crop field to. And this one has just been done with the solo. And it's actually quite dry on top. With the legs probably eight inches deep. This is a good thing with this land, it does, when it dries and fractures after wet and dry, it crumbles. And it's just a really artificial structure, isn't it? You've got quite a, you know, homogenous, it's quite similar structure. You've got no sort of, you know, variability in cracking and all that sort of stuff. All just quite similar, quite tight, no roots in there. Low amount of pores. You're already doing it there. Or? Yeah. If you're going through it, you yeah. Know, yeah, that's it there. And that'll be still on some of the wing, won't it? Yeah. So the sugar beet has been stacked here by the trailers. You saw when we lifted this about three weeks ago. So that's been in the heat that time. It will have lost a little bit of sugar since then, but there's nothing we could do about that with the getting it in, trying to get it in the in the factory. You can see when we tip the sugar bait through this machine, you can see now here. This is all soil and tops dropping out. Look at this here. It's a bit of a mixture now. If that goes in the factory, in the lorries and in the factory, we get penalised for it. So we need to take out as much as we can. So this is the best way of doing it. It's a really old machine, this, but it does do a good job for us. It'll load one of these lorries in probably 15 to 20 minutes. And you can see the sugar beet there. James taking it up. So then we've moved that to the pile over here. We've got a trailer load there. And we then spread this back onto the field it came from. And that for us is quite important because you can get some soil borne diseases with sugar beet if you grow it in too tight a rotation. And this is a prime example here. So this is what happens. I think this is called violet root rot. And if you grow sugar beet in too close a rotation, so uh, too many years or not enough years gap between each crop, then this is what happens. So that's why we put that back on the field. We spread it out very thinly and work it back into the soil and yes you do lose a few small ends of sugar beet here and the small roots but the amount of soil you get out you can see there's a small clod the amount of soil you get out it more than offsets the small losses you get from little sugar beet uh, bits of chippings like that but you can just see here the amount of stuff that's in in uh, in this heap so there's an awful lot of um, rubbish so uh, the sugar in this lorry, there'll be about 
3,000 bags of sugar in this 29 tonnes uh, load when it's processed. And obviously this is English, British sugar rather than foreign cane sugar. So while we're talking about climate at the moment, it's very environmentally climate friendly because cane sugar has to be imported from the other side of the world. And so this is why it's far more environmentally friendly. And when we're looking at the actual sugar or inside a sugar beet and the contents, I'll just grab, you can see it's white. There's a small root there. And you will need roughly, and if I get these out, you need roughly six sugar beet roots, which makes one bag of sugar. So when those are processed, that will contribute towards one bag of silver spoon. Now don't forget, it must be silver spoon because that is made from English sugar beet. It's Tate and Lyle that's made from foreign sugar cane. So these lorries now are going to the New York factory, which is only about 10 miles away from us. So again, very, very sustainable and short, short food miles. It's Wednesday morning and I've just arrived at the Midlands Machinery Show at Newark. It's only 10 minutes down the road from me. So I uh, thought I'd come and have a look. And for those of you not quite sure of the history, the uh, I think the owners of this show are the team of the guys that started the Lammer event. And Lammer stands for Lincolnshire Agricultural Machinery Manufacturers Association. That started at Lincolnshire Showground. It then moved here to Newark and then it outgrew Newark and went to Peterborough. Didn't last long there, two or three years probably. And then it was uh, now at the NEC in Birmingham, which is the best place for it. And that's a good event, but this is the, uh, a local one near to me. So we'll have a quick look round. This looks good. It's a grain pusher for the front of your forklift. Looks like it's eight metres long six meters with that bit and that bit and then two extension eight meters looks like it's got a big hard rubber wear strip on the bottom so the interesting machine here at agriweld what, what is sorry, what are you saying you're calling it it's is it low assist. low disturbance subsoil yeah. but it's the assist, it's the assist. Yeah. And uh, you can put a drill on the back here, or set of discs or anything you like. And it will, when you come into the end of the field with the drill, you lift these legs out the ground. This frame will lift out. It's on linkage through there. Ram there, it lifts out, folds a little bit so the drill will turn underneath the wings. And uh, low disturbance subsoil, yeah, looks good and interesting sheer design here what were you saying just looking at the we call it the snap bar so so instead of having sheer pins and sheer bolts and that is mostly cut through apart from a bit at the end and a bit at the end there and how many tons shear yeah three ton three tons so once one one shears you lower it down and you'll have another go so you've got three attempts that's yeah. it so if that bottom's come off there, you just go onto that top one, get this leg there, pins in. And there's a collar inside as well. If you've got any drainage problems or water problems, this is the boy. If you've got the power to pull two leg moles, that obviously swings up there and creates a bigger hole through the ground through the drainage channel these are made locally to me near Sleaford very well built machinery this we need to probably swap our sprayer soon so we need to have a word with, uh, with these boys
Yeah, lots of nice neat cab. Good visibility around the booms. That way and that way. Ag leader screen. Yeah, nice spacious cab. Interesting machine. It's a self-propelled gravel machine for drainage, for filling in the trenches. You can see it straddles the trench. So you drive with the trench underneath and the conveyors there put the gravel Hey yo! Look at. <laughs> so, so we've just had a look at this this gravel machine, and of course Jonathan's making me a coffee. And look at this fantastic British English silver spoon sugar. None of that foreign cane sugar rubbish. Got an 8RX here, which of course we tried a few months ago, and we're saying about this axle. What were you saying about the? Um, yeah, so some diff? some of the. The, the reduction gear is still in the in the normal place it is, but some of it's moved into the centre of the tractor yeah, to get so, so reducing the, the space here to get the turning circle from the front axle. Yeah, and you can see there with that with the track. Is that full lock? I would imagine that's nearly full lock. But yeah. we also lifted the engine up yeah. so that we can tip and tuck it underneath. It's got it. underneath. Yeah. So we've got a lot of thought going gone into it. So has it been designed right from the ground up with tracks on, not just a tractor with a with that's yeah, had yeah, four yeah. tracks put on it? The, as I say, the engine's from the 8000 transmission. Yeah. So that's the biggest back, back end on an agricultural tractor that John Deere's ever made. It's even bigger than a 9RX. Right, yeah. And um, obviously it's got a new front axle, we just talked about that. Yeah. Um, and the configuration, we've moved the hitch further back so it doesn't come into contact with the track units. Yeah. We lifted the whole tractor up. It's got a big ground clear. It's yeah, you can big, see that. Three quarters of a metre. But principally that's there to tuck the tracks underneath to get the um, yeah, you can see get good. turning circle. Right. Stiff locks on both corners. But you can engage and disengage. Yeah. Back, so full set of disc locks, which is, you know, advantageous. Are you all right? Yes, I'm just getting you one sorted. A <laughs> couple. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you can see here, this, this point and the, the hitch point is further, well, further away from the tractor. Yeah. So that if you turn tightly, which you can with this tractor, because you've got a lock on the front, you're not going to come into contact with the track units. Right, yeah. It is, I mean, again, you look at that back axle. Christ, there's some... It's bigger than the 9RX axle. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Crikey. How many spools have you got? Six? Five? Yeah, so the standard, we do five. Yeah. But there's an option to go, to go further than that. Yeah. And you can have mid-stacks and you can do it. Just right, like yeah. yeah, yeah. You can even have a pick-up. It's not, not really no. that sensible, but there's one or two around with pick-up. So I remember when we put this on uh, on our Weybridge, it was more or less dead on 20 tonnes. It is dead on 20. With a, with a base tractor with no sort of weight. Yeah. Between 19 and a half, depending on spec. And yeah. Tons, and our, and our, our quad track was a, with fully full of fuel, our quad's about 29. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's circa eight to nine tonnes lighter mm. than the quad track. Yeah. 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 Very impressive. Yeah, and how many units do you say are out at the minute? There's probably... 70 odd units in the field yeah. with another 20, 30 to come. To come, yeah. So we're not far off 100, we will get to 100. Yeah. yeah. Never know, you might see one at Lednam. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> another interesting point is it's friction drive, yeah. and of course, a lot of lugs there to drive it. So, what keeps the track tension? There must be, is there a ramp? Yeah, so normal sort of system is, is, is down here. We've got an adjuster here, but, but mainly it's on hydraulics and the, using the front idler, if that's the right front. Yes, to, yeah. To do that. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, both both front and rear is the same principle. And there you've got the lugs there that bite into yeah. the bars here. So you've probably got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine lugs there gripping. Yeah. And there's a good few, I don't know exactly uh, six on the front. Yeah, same and that's the same principle, friction drive. Absolutely the same, exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Inside one of the other buildings now. Nice 
quite a lot to, in this shed. Grain handling and care. I thought straight away of you. Chandler's local Aco dealer to me. Some fence, vultures. sprayers they're also not far from me in Lincolnshire yet another low disturbance machine some sort of a disc in front seems to be all the rage at the minute looks quite good a little bit more aggressive wing to it drill because I do want to try this I think a bit narrow for us three meters wide but I do wonder about trying one looks like it'll move a lot of soil though so that's my only slight hesitation Another good manufacturer, Horsch. Wondering about trying one of these drills as well. We are wanting to move less soil, get into a more flexible system direct drill some we'll still keep the free flow but i do want to get into a situation where we've got a machine that will do direct drilling true direct drilling but um still would keep the free flow and use both there are some situations where that drill just is simply superb when you look at our crops we've got established this year but we do need to move a bit less soil so that's why i want to look at something else lights have just come on it's four o'clock soon be heading off let's catch this uh, another local dealer to me shaman's Done a lot of business there over the years they're about 10 miles away this bednar stuff's well made this is a drill Looks like there's a lot going on in there. Oh, no, Nate. Are you all right? Yeah, are you? <laughs> there's only you would do that. <laughs> So I'm just with uh, Bednar looking at the uh, looking at the drill. Wayne's just talking us through it, right? Wayne, you were just saying about these cultivation bits. Yeah. So basically, in, in this area here, we've got our aggressive discs where we, we can cultivate if we want. Yep. So um, we, these are hydraulically adjustable. Um, from in terms of how these discs work. The aggressive means that we can work them very shallow, yeah. but still get an awful lot of chopping incorporation. Yeah. So the classic scallop disc, 
we have to work quite deep to get the full use of, of the circumference of the disc, where this we can work as shallow as two and a half centimetres. Right, yeah. But if we don't want to cultivate at all, we can lift these up out of the way. Completely out of work. And we can put these in. These are our turbo discs. Now those discs, are they in line with the, with the coulters behind? In Dead in line with those. So right. whether, we, whether we're 167 spacing or 125 like this machine is, yeah. these turbo discs are in line. Right. So what we can do is we can put these into the ground. Because of the crinkle cut of the disc, yeah. it creates a nice little bit of till, but it means that we're opening up ready then for our seeding coulters at the rear. Right, yeah. Yeah. These seed coulters then, as a, as a total um, uh, package, is 130 kilos of pressure. But what we can do, just for, for ease of numbers, is because we've already opened a slot with our turbo coulters, we can come in, in here and put 30 kilos of pressure on the disc, just yep. to put the seed in, and 100 kilos onto the, onto the onto press the wheel on the to close up the slot. Yeah. And that will close the slot, will yes. it? Yes, yeah, definitely. Because that's yeah. some of the problems with some of these drills, is that you've got to do something with another machine afterwards to either move some soil, because yeah. the seed's visible. Yeah, no, not, not at all. So uh, we've, we've got hydraulics which are, are operating. We've got this, this hydraulic ram here, which operates the main pressure. Yeah. So it's twisting the bar to put the pressure on. The got you. And then we've got this other hydraulic ram here, which is twisting the yellow beam here which in turn through this linkage that's is then on, on the press wheel deriving our, our depth control yeah. or, or our, our pressure at our press and then that other hopper on the back so the third the third hopper uh, that can be used for slug pellets other decks or a, a, a companion crop and that is distributed through this splash plate on every other culture oh i see down there yeah yeah, yeah. okay great so more important Interesting couple of Unimogs. So I'm just leaving the Midlands Machinery Show. Got here about 11 o'clock. It's now nearly five o'clock. And the uh, trouble I've got with it being so local to me is that I can't go more than five yards without uh, speaking to people and uh, but that's great it's a good networking event and uh, not quite as much machinery here as I'd have uh, I thought there might be and um, but still a few things to look at and spare parts and other technology things inside the buildings but yeah quite a good little event as it's only 10 minutes down the road for me here at Newark Showground in Nottinghamshire it's a useful thing to come to and just catch up um, and talk to other fellow farmers. I always enjoy talking to other, other farmers. You always get such a great perspective of things and ideas from people by sharing information. And failures and successes, you just can't beat it. Hedge cutters in the dock. Slight little issue with hydraulic pipe snapped off the end there that goes into the back of the tractor there. So we've got to get that out, which is gonna be a bit of a job oil on the floor as well so that needs looking at which is not going to be easy and also we've had a ram break on the on the puma so we've had that taken off and sent away a steering ram broken there and the other end so that's been uh, looked at so that was the newark showground just through there there we were yesterday this is uh, another group that john deere um, own tarmac planing company and this is the road into Farrell's depot you can see a bit better now it's daylight a few machines lined up here 8 RX and a 9 RX as well So there's the A17. Newark is just through there. So this depot is about eight miles from me, that's all. So 10 minutes down the A17. So yeah, this is the new depot.
bit of a different view in daylight. Looking down to the stores and service area. Still a lot of soil and things to move and sort. Deep showground where the Midlands machinery shows just through there. So what, what's happening where all this soil and everything is then? So where the cabins are? So as you come in through the gate, where the cabins are, uh, they'll be cleared and we're going to put uh, an area of concrete there with loading ramps, etc. So that will be yeah, a safe area for lorries for, yep. for loading and unloading. And then you can see right around the outside of the uh, the fence line where the stone's going down there. It's yep. going to have a, a, a band of truck cell right the way around the edge. Which is band the of what? Truck cell, which is the same as the stuff the new machinery behind us oh, is on. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah, basically hard standing, but with a sort of permeable surface on it. Yeah. And where the soil, etc., is that will be cleared, and there's going to be a grass area in there for demonstrations for ground care machinery. Oh, good. Uh, to your left, there's going to be a, another area of concrete, which will be for uh, hire and demo kit stuff that's coming on and off uh, yep. regularly. And so that's the truck cell under the new machines over there. Oh, there no, I see, yeah. So, due to the planning and runoff um, re requirements, that's why we've had all the different types of surfacing put down. Yeah, a lot of it's been been led by the yeah, the, the building inspectors. The plannings, yeah. Uh, but it, it, it should hopefully break it up a bit and leave you know, quite an attractive finish. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, looks, uh, looks impressive. So what we got here then? We've got... So this is the meeting and training room. Yeah. Um, so we have the availability for um, seasonal training for operators, um, also training for our staff on product updates and, uh, and new new machinery. Nice size room for the job. So, so what have we, what have we got there? Is that the parts? So three parts desks in the, on the right hand side, and then on the left hand side is the service centre and after sales and then uh, the sales and technology centre on the uh, on the very left through those doors. Right, brilliant. So here's the tech's computer centre so the technicians can come and set their computers up in here and yep. link into the network and then we've got the job sheets forum, the job scheduler forum on, on the, the screen. There. So they can look into what they're doing the next couple of days. Yep, right, and into the workshop. And into the workshop. Um, so, great open space. So get plenty of, uh, plenty of kit in here now. Yeah, yeah. This uh, interesting device is fantastic. Really safe for removing back wheels. So this is the first one we've got in the group is just set up here as a ah, demonstration uh, yeah. for training our uh, technicians but um, you can move the tractor with that so we can get it washed out prepped ready for uh, for servicing and other work incredible you can move a track move it like that with that on but look at all the rubbish and all the crap behind here you can get it all cleaned out washed out blown out for servicing yeah makes it a lot so a how lot. does this work that, oh i see all the weights on there so as you lift your arms up, lift your linkage up there, it rolls on that. It, yeah, it pivots on there and then um, rolls it on the front wheels. Yeah, so you can move this outside to wash it onto your wash bed. Brilliant. Nice and light as well in here. Yeah, all on the floor heated as well, so the technicians aren't laying on a cold concrete floor wow. when, they're, uh, when they're under stuff. Yeah, you see, it's not, not stone cold. Yeah. How many doors? One, two, three, four doors. Four doors, and then on the left hand side. Oh, one there as well. One for new machinery going out. Yeah, yeah. Incredibly smooth floor. You can feel it's not cold either under your feet. Fantastic. So, outside, nice area of concrete. So, outside, yeah. Lovely area for the workshop guys to to move machinery about on uh, wash bay over there on the uh, oh over there yeah uh, so we're going to get another one put in um, and then uh, have to go around up onto the roadside onto the front show display yeah here's one of your Kramers Kramers and behind it is the air source heat pump that uh, oh you've got for your underfloor heating warms the building right Kramers, weren't they badged as class 
two or three years ago. Yeah, they had a marketing agreement with Plus. Yeah. Um, and then they've, uh, they've they've gone back to their own colours. Brilliant. Walking round now to the front of the building. So we've got the A17 right nearby there. Back round the front. Brilliant. Thanks, Adam. So that was it. Bit of a tour around. Must admit, really impressive setup and depot. Never dealt with ferals before, but I can see being so near to me, we will be doing. And uh, John Deere as well. We haven't had one of those since a 7810, probably 25 years ago, I think it was. So quite a while. Yeah, hello, Frankie, looking in the back. So yeah, we've had uh, a good uh, good hour here looking around. So it's a really impressive setup. So we'll see in, uh, how much we deal with these guys in the future, but no doubt we will be doing. We're spraying glyphosate today, Friday afternoon. Lovely still conditions. This field's coming spring beans next year. So we've got all this greenery, which is uh, wheat that's come out the back of the combine and there'll be some other broadleaf weeds amongst it as well. You can see here, lovely still day, no drift from this. Perfect conditions for putting glyphosate on. Just remember as well, what you see coming out the sprayer is not all chemical. We're putting three litres a hectare of glyphosate on, mixed in with a hundred, sorry, the total volume is a hundred litres a hectare. So out of that hundred litres, there's only three litres is Glyphosate, the, another 97 litres is water. So 97% of what we're putting on here is water. It's used as a carrier. And we need all these weeds to uh, be controlled. Got a bit of volunteer oilseed rape there and some wheat. And there's other bits and bobs growing amongst this here. See some got weeds growing in there. So we need to control this, all these weeds and clean them up before we plant the next crop. And this is the best way of doing it. If we had to, if we moved all the soil, which we can't do because it would be too wet underneath, remove all the soil, we're causing environmental damage, we're causing CO2 emissions as well from the release of the nitrogen when you move the soil. So obviously that's the least efficient way and the most damaging way to the environment. This is the best way of doing it. And also, the only damage we're doing to the soil now is running on it every 32 metres with the sprayer. So because it's dry at the minute today on top, if you look there, it's hardly marking the soil. There's the tyre marks from the sprayer. We've got 700 millimetre wide tyres on the sprayer. So it's a really good way of controlling these weeds and uh, getting a perfect start for the next crop. So the product we've been using is glyphosate. We're using one called Rodeo, the active ingredients of this is glyphosate. There's quite a few different products. You can see there, 360 grams per litre. Warning symbol there, but also worth remembering, same warning symbol is on a can or container of ferro liquid there. So if you think glyphosate is harmful, then you must also think ferro liquid is harmful. So that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Just going back to sugar beet, we had 27 loads in the factory. I've looked at the results of those. We've averaged out at 18.3% sugar. The factory average for this last week is 17.5, so that's good. And uh, our previous average when we had some in three weeks ago was 18.1, so it has increased slightly, but how much it will have decreased in the heap because it was there for three weeks, I'm, I'm not too sure. But the look of the results, not too, not too bad. Our soil um, tears were 3.7, which again are, are, is good. Anything below five is good. The factory this week was 4.2, so, so that's good as well. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Any questions, please come on to me. Click like, click subscribe, and we'll come back to you next week.